another edition of the big picture folks and we're of course talking about things that matter to you today and will matter to you in the future and something that matters in the past present future whatever tense you pick is energy petrol uh, petrol prices the price of electricity that's been a huge concern for kenyans since about 2020 2021 um, the president outgoing president uhuru kenyatta tried to make um, some steps to ameliorate the price of uh, of fuel of the uh, price of energy uh, the price of electricity try and impact your bills but things might be changing the waves of change seem to be the winds of change seem to be blowing if the IMF is to be believed, at least with regard to our subsidies. And there's no better guest for us to be able to discuss this and to understand what's going on and what will be going on in the future as the Director General of the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority, Mr. Daniel Kipto. Asante sana for making it. And, and thank you very much for being on The Big Picture. Uh, Kipto, what we do on The Big Picture, of course, is aside from discuss the, the, the topics of the day, we we'll also try and do a lot of fact checking. And that's yeah. behind you. We have Tracy Bonareri, who's from our fact-checking desk. Tracy, I know you have a few things uh, planned for us um, in, in the course of this show. I'm hoping that uh, it's something related to what we're discussing. Yes, it is. Yeah? yeah? All right, great. We'll catch up with you in a second. The concern for Kenyans, and I think perhaps even if, before I start with the, with the concern, is, is really about the mandate of, of the EPRA. I was reading it um, yesterday, and it is broad. It is yes, broad, it is. but if you were to crystallize it for, for Kenyans, what does the EPRA do? What's its mandate? Uh, thanks, John, and thanks for having me. I think, really, uh, the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority, uh, we are the successor entitled to the Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, we became the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority mm -hmm. in 2019. Uh, in March of 2019, once uh, we had our parliament pass the Energy Act 2019 and the Petroleum Act 2019. Uh, a question that people may have is, what is the difference between ERC, as it was called then, Energy Regulatory Commission, and the Energy and Petroleum Regulatory Authority? Uh, I think there's a significant shift in mandate uh, across uh, the entire energy ecosystem mm. uh, that was brought about by the enactment of those two legislation. But uh, sticking to our role as the authority, in a nutshell, our role is the technical and economic regulation of the electricity and the petroleum sectors in this country. Mm -hmm. So what we then do is we regulate, uh, if you look at electricity, the electricity has a value chain that runs from generation. We then generate the power. You then move that power from where it is generated to where it is required mm -hmm. through transmission. This is the high voltage uh, power lines that you see. Mm -hmm. You then step it down from an engineering standpoint and then distribute it in the localities and then retail it, which is now the pure commercial function of selling power to you and I as consumers. Mm -hmm. So that's on the electricity side. On uh, the oil and gas side, uh, this is one of the changes, uh, big shifts that was introduced in the N Petroleum Act of 2019. Uh, previously, the Energy Regulatory Commission, as it was then, was only regulating the mid and downstream sectors of the uh, petroleum value chain. Mm -hmm. uh, this is your storage depots, your pipelines, your retail stations. Mm -hmm. uh, we then had an additional mandate, which was a mandate that was moved, which was historically being handled by the Ministry of uh, in charge of petroleum, mm -hmm. uh, which is upstream petroleum. Uh, so this is your exploration, uh, your development and production of uh, uh, resource, uh, mm -hmm. oil or gas resources uh, that have been discovered in the country. Uh, so this is a new mandate that has come to us as a regulator. So when also on the petroleum side, now regulate the entire value chain. Mm. This is upstream, midstream and downstream. Mm. So as you say, our mandate is quite wide and I'm happy to be here today yeah. uh, to be able to demystify, demystify some of the myths, to be able to uh, also educate the public as well and uh, answer some of the topical issues uh, that are currently being debated uh, across the country. Let's actually get into those topical issues now. Um, and as part of, you know, it's, it's conditional continuation of its, its relationship with Kenya um, through loans, through etc., the International Monetary Fund has been dissuading Kenya from continuing with its subsidies program. Now, I have, my question is two parts, yes. right? Because for you, subsidies are important because you're, you're speaking with oil marketers. Yes. And, and they have been very direct about what the price of fuel should be commercially, right? Are subsidies a good thing for this economy? Well, I, I think um, I'm not an economist, but I, these days I ask myself what I am. <laughs> but uh, uh, really, uh, subsidies, the general uh, uh, economic uh, uh, 
position is that subsidies are not good, mm -hmm. but uh, they are necessary in certain extraordinary circumstances. And I think I just want to put this into perspective, is that um, over the last three years, uh, the world, uh, mm -hmm. we as uh, humankind have gone through uh, unprecedented times, mm -hmm. both from a uh, standpoint of the pandemic and also where we are in terms of uh, the economic position mm -hmm. of, uh, of, 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 the, of the globe. Uh, so when we talk to a subsidy, and, and, and just uh, to give clarity, and I'm, this is on relation specifically to uh, this, uh, the stabilization program that has been run by the government on the fuel side, mm -hmm. uh, is really not a subsidy. Uh, the thinking around setting up a stabilization fund uh, through the petroleum development levy was to allow for the government to be able to build up a fund mm -hmm. uh, during times when the oil price was low, Mm -hmm. uh, just going back to COVID, we did have uh, the barrel crash to about $30. Uh, but at the time, uh, we were under lockdown. Mm -hmm. We were all in our homes. Uh, uh, even Kenyans did not really uh, experience the experience benefit, the benefit yeah. of a low oil price environment because mm -hmm. we're all home. And at that time, we were able to build up this fund. Mm -hmm. And uh, this fund was to be utilized on a rainy day, such as what really happened um, back end of last year with a shock into the market. Uh, but really, the the stabilization program was to enable Kenyans to be cushioned from the adverse effects of high energy prices, mm -hmm. which is not only a Kenyan phenomenon, but a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge has been is that uh, this challenge has persisted for longer than anybody anticipated, mm -hmm. uh, but really it's the nature of the oil and gas business. Mm -hmm. If you look historically, uh, the oil and gas uh, business is always on a boom and bust cycle. So you have a high oil price environment, you have your oil price crashing, mm -hmm. and it's very cyclical in nature. And this is the nature of the business that we're in. Mm -hmm. For us as the regulator, we have two mandates. One is to regulate and ensure the players uh, stick within the rules of the game, which mm -hmm. is set in law, in legislation and in regulation. We also have another mandate, which is to advise the government on matters policy because we are the technical um, as a regulator who have a better understanding of the technical issues yeah. that are portending in the sector. Okay, so so the, st the stabilization fund, where are we now? Is it almost completely wiped out or, or, or is there enough of that fund to be able to continue to try and stabilize prices for maybe the next three months, four months? How, how far are we from the end of that fund? The, the, the reality is that uh, what we do collect from uh, the stabilization fund, this is a petroleum development levy, mm. is uh, a far cry from what we actually require to then cushion Kenyans from this adverse effect of the prices. Mm -hmm. If you look today, for instance, on uh, diesel, AGU, uh, we are talking about 54 shillings uh, difference between what the price is at the pump and the, what the price ought to be. Mm. So we have a, f a, a huge gap, and uh, this is why the government has had to step in. And as you correctly said, the president, his excellency, the president, uh, took interventions to have the exchequer support mm -hmm. the additional requirement to ensure that we don't have, don't have runaway costs mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of, of fuel at the pump. I think what's also important to say is that um, the effect of having high energy prices, uh, and particularly high fuel prices, is there's a knock-on effect into the economy. Mm. There is a ripple effect where people uh, will not be able uh, to uh, make ends meet, the cost of living will go up, inflationary pressures will then uh, hit government. Mm -hmm. So it's important, Im imperative for a government to take active steps. And um, in our experience and uh, what we've seen happening all over the world during this crisis, which I've, again I'll say is not a Kenya mm -hmm. pro specific problem, but a global problem, is governments have stepped in to be able to cushion their populace. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not seeing it only in developing countries, mm -hmm. you're seeing it even more so in developing world. If you look at France, yeah. if you look at Germany, look at Ireland, you look at the US. Mm -hmm. This is a topical discussion. And the question has always been from the public in each of these countries mm -hmm. is what is the government doing? So really in terms of government prioritizing mm -hmm. to then put in place mechanisms to ensure its citizens are cushioned, in my mind, is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in as much as it, it might be the right thing to do, it doesn't seem like it's a long-term solution at all because you have um, the dollar galloping away in, term, in, in, in terms of valuation against the shilling. Um, you're having inflationary pressure. I think we were up, what, 3.5% from last month? Correct. Um, there, there are all of these pressures that are being brought to bear on the, on the economy. And one wonders that, fine, 
if if you use money to be able to to stabilize the economy yes fuel it might have a knock on effect on on uh, on the economy um if we didn't do it what where is that money coming from because at the end of the day also we also have a debt crisis that we're trying to manage we have recurrent expenditure that we're trying to manage where is this money going to be able to come from for us to continue in an in an environment where possibly even the fuel levy fund might get impacted by all of these economic shocks if people are not expending as much fuel. Yes, I mean, in, in our conversations as a regulator of the government, I think it's an issue of sector prioritization. Mm. And I think it's important to say that uh, we've seen an inflection point. And as I said, this is cyclical in nature. Yeah. Um, the highest prices we've seen uh, were in June. Mm. Uh, we've now seen the last two, three months, uh, the global prices coming down. Mm. Uh, we do have a lag about a 45-day lag in our pricing yeah. because of the time it takes us to procure and the time the products land in Mombasa and get into a system. We are hoping, fingers crossed, because really these are globally traded commodity. Any other shock would also impact mm. uh, the price. Uh, we are seeing the prices coming down. Mm. Uh, we hope that they continue on that trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, we anticipating that if they do continue on that trajectory, we'll be able to reach parity. One mm. of our views is that there is need then to, to trade off as and against the need to remove the subsidy and wean it off in, in a structured manner and the falling of the prices so that then there's a convergence at some point. Mm, mm. So really it's a, it's a delicate balance between how do you prioritize your other interests as a country mm -hmm. and this is really not our role as a regulator but it, for us is to advise the government. So we're just crossing our fingers that nothing happens around the world that could cause a further shock otherwise it could be a dire, dire situation. For the yes, country. because uh, as you correctly say, there's the question of sustainability. Mm. Because these funds, over and above what we had then set aside through the Petroleum Development Levy for a rainy day, uh, has now caused uh, the government to have to step in mm. to then subsidize this from its own coffers. Mm -hmm. And this is not, and this is what I think the bank, uh, the IMF and the World Bank were speaking to, yeah. is that one, the subsidy is not sustainable and we don't have the resources to sustain it in the long term mm. or even in the medium term. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're really banking on the trend we've seen from June, which is a global decrease in the price in the international market. Yeah. And uh, then the interventions that the government needs to put in place to try and bridge the mm -hmm. delta between what the prices currently are mm -hmm. through stabilization and what they ought to be yeah. uh, over the next couple of months. And, and one of the long-term strategies that uh, the EPRA might be considering, of course, is renewable energy so that we are not as dependent on global shocks and we're able to generate as much as we can internally. Wh what that means for the economy, we'll get into in a, in a moment. Yeah. Um, Tracy, I want to bring you in here for, for a moment and, and speak actually to renewable energy. Mm -hmm. um, Kenya is seen as one of the leading you know, nations in terms of generation of at least geothermal energy yes. and other sources of, of renewable energy. But what's the true position? Um, I know there was a speech that you guys were looking into that, uh, that, that there were quite a number of claims that were made with respect, with respect to where we are. Yes. Ah, yeah. So, uh, during the 8th State of the Nation Address, yeah. President Uhuru claimed that Kenya is leading in the African continent mm -hmm. in the generation of green energy. Mm -hmm. Well, Kenya is indeed leading, mm -hmm. but it's not the only country that's leading. So we are neck to neck with Morocco. Mm -hmm. According to the 2019 report, the Global Electricity Review Report, yeah. uh, uh, Kenya and Morocco uh, have the highest mm -hmm. levels of wind <clears throat> and solar energy. So they are both at 16 and 15 percent respectively. Mm. So it was misleading in the terms of Kenya is the it's only the outright country. leader. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's a good one. I'll, I think we'll come back to you for a few more. Eh? Mm -hmm. If you're seeing the pivot across the world, especially in continental Europe, towards uh, cleaner and more renewable sources of energy, um, the question becomes how will that impact Africa, but more, more, more than even how it will impact us, why are we not the ones who are leading this conversation globally, given that we have perhaps um, you know, renewable energy sources in abundance, perhaps even more than Europe and, and, and continental Europe, United States at, and elsewhere? Well, I think, I think this is uh, first, we need to recognize that um, yeah. Sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly Kenya and the region, mm. the Greater Eastern African region, is uh, endowed with a lot of natural resources. 
Uh, but the question that you ask is how do we translate these natural resources mm. and uh, harness them for the benefit of the people? I think having the resources one thing and developing the resources the other. Mm. Uh, and I just want to um, uh, pick up uh, uh, from her point in terms of is Kenya a, a leader mm. in uh, renewable energy? The answer is yes. Mm. Um, in terms of the size of our system as compared to some of our North African counterparts such as Morocco, what helps Morocco in, is that they've invested in a huge uh, wind farms and mm -hmm. huge solar farms. But I think going back to potential, for us Kenya, one area that we are global leader is geothermal. Mm. Uh, without a doubt, we are global leader in geothermal. We do have about 10,000 megawatts of geothermal potential, mm. of which we have only developed uh, just slightly over 1,000 megawatts. Mm. Um, in terms of how do we then harness this resource, uh, one of the big challenges towards development of these resources is that attracting capital, mm. uh, technical expertise. On the technical expertise side, we've really built technical expertise, just to take the example of geothermal. Mm. Uh, the state-owned utility, majority-owned uh, Kenjin, is a leader. Uh, Kenjin is now setting up a center of excellence mm. uh, for the region uh, on behalf of uh, the East African community to then share this technical expertise that they've built over the years mm -hmm. in geothermal. Uh, a case in point is Kenjin has been contracted by the Ethiopian government. They're in Ethiopia mm. doing... Uh, exploration in geothermal for the Ethiopian government, the in Djibouti. Mm. So this is a testament of our ability. But going back to the financing side, mm. uh, t traditionally power projects have been project financed. And project finance is not only the ability of you having the resource, mm. but the ability of you to structure mm. these uh, projects in a manner that you are able then to derive value and more importantly attract the foreign direct investment that is required. Mm. I think this is the conversation that was had in Glasgow at COP26 yeah. and it's a conversation that will be had in another month and a half mm -hmm. at COP27 which will be in Egypt and this will be the Africa COP. Mm. And I think the question of the Africa COP is how do we attract the resources required to harness mm. the natural resources we have in mm. Africa. Mm -hmm. And that's really the question. And, and really uh, what we've been talking about is a transition, what we're calling yeah. an energy transition, a transition away from fossil fuels mm -hmm. to renewables uh, that is being driven uh, to combat climate change. We mm -hmm. can see what's happening in Pakistan uh, the last couple of weeks uh, with floods. Uh, mm -hmm. This is impacts of climate change. And the question has been about a just transition. Mm -hmm. If you look at contributors of emissions uh, towards uh, climate yeah. change, uh, countries such as Kenya have not contributed, mm -hmm. but our president has gone and made a commitment uh, mm -hmm. that uh, Kenya will take the lead in terms of uh, Africa to drive the energy transition, to drive green energy based on our positioning already mm -hmm. as a country, mm -hmm. with as a country which is already endowed with these resources. Mm -hmm. For us, our big question as Africans and also as Kenyans should mm -hmm. be first on access, yeah. because you cannot transition from something you do not have. Mm -hmm. and, so, and even in that transition, you cannot transition from something um, perhaps that's, that's um, harmful to the environment, but something that isn't, but is incredibly expensive and exclu you know, excludes a majority of the, of the public who need it. You know, and, and that, that's where my, my question comes from, right? What, what, for instance, is the EPRA going to present around making this kind of transition something that we see over the next ten, five years, ten years? How are we going to phase it? What does it look like? Which industries is it going to affect? You know, whether it's in, even in terms of importation, the kinds of cars that we're going to be importing over the next, uh, you know, few years. The kind of energy mix that Kenya Power is going to have to employ to be able to drive down energy costs. What are, what's the actual conversation? The, the, there is a conversation going on, both from us as the regulator advising government, but also at the ministry. Mm. Uh, the ministry has put out uh, a white paper, which is really aspirational, as to where Kenya sees itself in 2040, mm -hmm. both from an investment standpoint, in terms of what do we need to do in generation, to increase generation, what do we need to do in infrastructure development, which mm -hmm. I'll speak to uh, shortly, and also how do we then ensure that there's access but not only access, but then affordability, because mm -hmm. cost then becomes also a barrier to entry. Mm -hmm. But in terms of moving the resource to those who need it, we need to invest in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So there is a significant capex requirement for us to invest in transmission. When we're talking about EVs, uh, electric vehicles, mm -hmm. as, uh, as, as we call them, you're looking at first, do we have sufficient generation mm -hmm. to be able to support that transition? Do we have the infrastructure? Do we have mm -hmm. adequate transmission lines to move the power from where it's generated? Mm -hmm. And do we have, for instance, the charging points? We have Kenya Power now running a pilot. Mm -hmm. We have two or three SMEs coming into the picture. Mm 
to then uh, come in and uh, provide these services. Mm -hmm. But then they must do it in a manner which is one, technically sustainable. Uh, the technology around batteries and battery storage mm. is a conversation that we're currently having, both mm -hmm. in terms of battery storage for home solar systems or industrial solar systems, mm -hmm. but also utility scale. Because for natural, uh, for, for, for renewable energy, particularly when you talk of wind, mm. solar, uh, wind, uh, will, these are what we call intermittent sources of, 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 of energy. Mm. It's only God will determine or predict what time wind blows. Exactly. So when wind blowing in uh, Marsabit, where we mm. have the largest wind farm uh, in this country, uh, and it blows at 3 a.m. and we don't have a 24-hour economy, mm. and those contracts are not a call or take or pay basis, and that power, gets and that wasted. power then gets wasted, but it's mm. still a cost mm. to us. But if we then have utility scale storage, we're able to store some of this power mm. at times when we don't need it and utilize it at the time that we need. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the interventions in terms of investment of utility scale battery storage yeah. that will then accelerate our uptake of renewable yeah. energy. Now, to utility now scale. on battery storage in particular, um, you have countries like Zambia, you have countries like Congo that are producing the raw material that we need for longer term battery storage at scale now for yes. you know to be able to power your wind farms, etc. Where is the conversation, even at the Africa level, in terms of in terms of reorienting those kinds of resources or creating the kind of market that's competitive enough for for those kinds of raw materials not to leave the continent to stay here? But those conversations are being had. Mm. Uh, I've been privy to some of those conversations uh, in my engagement with the government through the ministry, and mm. we've had engagements with potential partners, uh, particularly looking at. Uh, uh, the area around Naivasha, mm -hmm. where you have a special economic zone set up by the government. You yeah. also have a special economic zone set up by Kenjan, because a, a lot of these critical minerals, as they are called, mm -hmm. um, there is a lot of export of these minerals to the Far East, and then the product then comes back here. Mm, as a finished good that we yes. pay premium for. But yeah. then I think looking at it from uh, a decentralization standpoint after COVID, where supply mm -hmm. chains are now being decentralized. It's a very good opportunity, and I think this is what the government is trying to do, uh, Kenjen, the ministry, to try mm -hmm. and attract uh, investment into these industrial parks, uh, mm -hmm. close to where generation is, so that you don't have a lot of losses transmitting power, mm -hmm. and uh, access to those resources, so that then you're able then to have that benefit of having those investments in country. Mm -hmm. So it's not only looking at the investments. Again, it's looking at you have a conducive environment from a legal and regulatory framework standpoint. Mm -hmm. and that is where we come in as a regulator to ensure our regulations are robust, they're in, 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 to international standard. Mm -hmm. They allow us to attract investment because our role as a regulator is not only to protect consumers, but also to provide a favorable climate for investors. So that then we balance the interests of investors and the consumers, yeah. ensure that investors are compensated for the risks assumed, and ensure that our consumers, who are the public, are not taken advantage of. Every time someone looks at their power bill and they look at the breakdown of the bill, a huge amount, you know, nearing or surpassing 50% is tax, right? And if we are trying to lower, um, you know, costs per kilowatt, um, of power that's either used in, uh, in a place like this, a studio like this, or in an industrial park, or even at home, perhaps the first place to attack is tax, right? Um, are you talking to government about tax? Because producing power is not a problem, at, at, you know, if you're looking at what happened with the last mile um, in terms of transmission, but also producing of power, we have quite a bit of potential, um, you know, with Kenjan, etc. But where is that conversation, go where has it reached in terms of bringing down? Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm smiling because maybe first is just to pick it up on, uh, yeah. on, on the issue of your bills and you look at mm. the breakdown in the bills. I think this is first, I think a testament of the transparency that we have as a regulator. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the fuel side on the 14th, we will publish a schedule that will show you uh, the cost buildup from mm -hmm. what is the landed cost to what is the cost of transportation on the pipeline, what is the cost of transportation by road, mm -hmm. what is the cost of, um, of uh, transportation to the station, what are the margins uh, to the retailers, what are your taxes, and what is ultimately the price. Mm -hmm. On the power side, similarly, you will then see a breakdown of what VAT is, mm -hmm. what the real electrification levy is, what are the ERC levies, what taxes are. Mm -hmm. But going back to the question of taxation, yes, we do uh, advise uh, on taxation, though taxation is in the purview of Parliament. Mm. So really it's the National Treasury that sets policy on behalf of the executive, and then the taxes are then passed by Parliament. Mm. We're able to advise. Uh, when we did have um, an increase in August last year of the fuel prices, mm. this is one question that the Finance Committee of Parliament asked us, yeah. is what is the percentage of taxes? Mm. 
on the fuel uh, it ranges between 42 to 48 percent mm. because some of those taxes are ad valorem so when mm. the cost of the product goes up and then the, the quantum of the tax also goes up yeah when the cost of the product comes down the quantum of the tax also comes down but the question to ask ourselves where do we sit relatively mm. to our neighbors in the region and relative to the globe in mm. terms of our taxation regime uh, our taxation regime is not punitive as we have compared it as a regulator with mm. other jurisdictions mm -hmm. Uh, the question then that comes is uh, on the fuel side, uh, are these taxes, how do you then alleviate from some of those shocks when you do have high, high oil price environment? Mm -hmm. One option is uh, having a stabilization program yeah. or a subsidy program in other countries yeah. or having a mechanism where you're able then to withdraw a tax. Mm -hmm. And this is really a trade-off between government programs. You have a three trillion budget. Mm -hmm. uh, we are significant contributors as a sector mm -hmm. to that fiscus. How do you balance between your development agenda and your taxation as a country? But mm. as I said again, this really is a balance to be mm. struck. Mm. And it's really the work of the National Treasury to then come up with this budget, look at how they then raise their revenues, mm -hmm. how to then expand these revenues, and how do you then pass it in the finance What's sector? the EPRA's recommendation on what you know tax rate, what effective tax rate um, or, or mix of taxes would be able to keep power costs relatively manageable for us even on the on the power side i think one of the big challenges on the power side is that power projects take five to seven years mm -hmm. to develop mm -hmm. you then have long-term contracts which are about 20 years some of the contracts that we are talking to are contracts that are signed historically mm -hmm. and are about some of them to come to the end of term yeah this is one of the big questions that the presidential task force on ppas that are set up by the government through mm -hmm. his the president was seeking to address one big area is the first 15% reduction of the cost of power that came in January, which we did approve a tariff uh, cut. Mm. The assumption at the time was that the first phase would come from efficiencies. Efficiencies in transmission and distribution mm. and efficiencies that would come in generation. The second phase was to come from a renegotiation of those contracts. Because unless and until you reduce your average generation cost, cost mm. of generation, uh, it's a tall order to then reduce uh, the cost of power. And what we did is to allow first for those efficiencies through these reforms to happen so that then the renegotiations can then occur. Mm -hmm. And we as a regulator then can come back at the tail end of the year and see where we are mm -hmm. post 10, 12 months and look at the entire lay of the land. Because how we calculate the tariff both on the fuel side and on the power side is on what we call a revenue requirement basis. Mm -hmm. So what is the cost of the product? What are the other components that build into it? And therefore these are the revenue requirements x billion then across the different customer segments to mm -hmm. then meet, match these revenue requirements so what we are trying to do is to ensure that there's efficiency in the sector as a regulator mm -hmm. as we regulate as we allow the utility who are our licensee working with the government to mm -hmm. be able to address the value chain and the biggest component is the cost of generation mm -hmm. if these renegotiations then succeed you're able then to lower your average generation cost we then bring efficiencies in transmission in distribution mm -hmm. and in retail and then eventually the customer will then have a long-term sustainable benefit yeah. of a reduction in the cost. All right. The second part of the question around the politics of power is around provenance and ownership of actual natural resources, right? We saw the kind of um, dispute we've had with Somalia over, over, over um, our territory, yes. and it's assumed over certain blocks that would be able to generate natu natural gas, etc. Yes. Um, there's There's possibly another dispute in the offing or could be over the Elemi Triangle, right, which is we yeah. share with, with, uh, with uh, South, South Sudan. Sudan. What are we doing to protect our own natural sources of, of uh, energy? What we are doing as the regulator, because uh, it's part of our mandate, is to map out the resources. On the mm. upstream side, it is now our mandate uh, to prepare for a bid round, which we are going to be preparing as a regulator, to mm. go out to the market to license our blocks within our territory. Mm. So we are clear on what our territory is. Uh, as a regulator, we are working on preparing for a bid round to go and market our oil blocks. Mm. We're also preparing an energy resource map that will map the entire resources from uh, wind to solar to mm. hydro to geothermal, mm -hmm. which will also be us as a regulator working with the ministry to update an investment prospectus. Yeah. Because as I said, we need to attract this capital to come into the country True. to then exploit these resources. So uh, that's really what we are doing ourselves. Uh, actually on that, um, you know, in as much as, as it, it's said that these things are public, mining cadastres in the past, and I know this is not your, your mandate specifically, yes. mining cadastres and other resource maps have been 
very tightly held you know pieces of information perhaps for strategic reasons but in the spirit of open governance this energy map that you're generating now will it be open to the public to be able to interrogate so that yes. we know a who owns what block when and we we are able to understand that yes yes they will all be public and mm. we'll put them up on our website both the block map and the number of concessions that we have yeah. for oil and gas exploration we'll also put up the energy resource map which we're in the final stages of developing mm -hmm. so that then investors are able to see where these resources located in our country yeah and then the ministry then will be updating with our support uh, an investment prospectus mm -hmm. that will then tell not only Kenyans but also potential investors that if you are to come to Kenya and you want to invest this is the process mm -hmm. these are the stages so that then uh, it is very clear and concise your word of advice with, uh, as a person who has a, a bit of a bird eye, bird's eye view over this entire you know sector to a person who's watching who might be making a decision about starting a business that might require a lot of energy or just someone who's trying to manage their bills at home what do the next few months look like? What does the next year look like? How should I jipanga for me to be able to, to survive and to be able to you know, do the things that I want to do? Yes, I think my advice would be we have uh, hopefully uh, come through the worst mm -hmm. uh, post June and hopefully things are getting better. And again, I just want to give encouragement because this energy challenges have not been specific to Kenya. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, if you look globally and particularly in the global north and the west, they have more significant challenges that we do uh, as a country. And I want to encourage um, Kenyans to continue investing. We have seen an increase in our peak demand mm -hmm. as a country. It has grown exponentially post-COVID from October last year, and we continue to grow. This is really a testament of uh, the resilience that we are as a, as a country, as an economy. Mm -hmm. We have seen a lot of confidence because people continue to invest in the sector. And one of the key indicators is demand. When yeah. you see demand growing, it shows you that there's confidence. People are investing. People are setting up businesses. People mm -hmm. are then uptaking more power. And we see ourselves continuing to grow. Kipto, before, before I let you go, there's, there's one final fact check that I'd wanted uh, Tracy to get into. Uh -huh. On 4th, April yes. 2022, uh, then Deputy President mm -hmm. who, William Ruto yeah. claimed that oil prices are higher in Kenya than they are in Uganda, mm -hmm. while the oil that gets to Uganda has to pass through Kenya. Through Kenya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we attributed our findings to the mm -hmm. EPRA. Mm -hmm. So there's a tweet here. Mm -hmm. So they set the retail prices for petroleum products mm -hmm. from 15th, no, this is one before, from, your Twitter handle, eh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from yeah. 15th March to 14th April. Mm -hmm. For super petrol, it's 134. Mm -hmm. uh, for diesel, it's 115 Kenya shillings. And according to a report by The Independent, Uganda, the prices for petroleum products in Uganda at the time were 165 mm. for petrol and 142 those are kenya shillings not uganda shillings mm. 142 kenya shillings so uh the claims made by the deputy president at the time were false fake news fake news wow all right um perhaps from a political stoop somewhere um some somewhere <laughs> where he was campaigning but yes. anyway thank you for trying to co continually keep them honest that bigger firimbi asante sana tracy thank you very much for your time kipto and as um, is our tradition, if you see that wall, there are a couple of people who, who are up there. Yeah. And we would like to add you to that wall now. Uh, our friend Louis over here has been taking a look oh, at you. Oh, that was <laughs> fast. <laughs> 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 Can show it to the camera. <laughs> yeah. Kipto, before you go, are you, are you making any plans to return to the rugby field? No, 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 no. no. I'm, I'm, I don't have that much insurance. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's, um, Are you sure? Yeah. Uh, but um, I, I still follow quite closely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, try and go for the games when I'm available. Yeah. And always go for the World Cup. Always go oh, for the World Cup. Yeah. So you're hoping that there's, there's, some, there's some hope in the repechage now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kenya being there or not, I'll still go. So yeah. I'll start with the sevens next week in Cape yes, yes. Oh, you're going down? Yes. Lucky and, man, and, lucky and, man. And, yeah. then, uh, and then hopefully... Uh, Stabilize the ship so that then I can take three weeks off in June yes. and go to France. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, there are some guys who are asking uh, to be in your in your in your suitcase as yeah. you go down yeah. to France. What many people don't know, you you are captain at, at some point yes. of uh, the national 15s team. So we have both uh, DG of the EPRA and former rugby captain here. Yeah. On our, on the big picture, what, yeah. What, what you don't say is we fought many battles yes, from yes. high school <laughs> with, this <man. laughs> with this guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've won some. He's won some. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't say who won the most. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Kipto, thanks a lot, man. Cheers, and man. it's a real pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And if you want to see Kipto's picture on the big picture, this is what it looks like. Um, it's going to be up on the wall, and we'll be sending you a copy. Um, once we're done with this season. Thank you. Asante Sana. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much once again for joining us. I hope we learned um, something about what's going on with our energy um, in this country, be it petrol, um, be it electricity, and what the potential is for this country. We'll see you in the next episode um, where we're going to be discussing bigger topics, even bigger topics, very interesting guests. As usual, my name is John Allen. Catch you on the next one.